yourselves up this morning.
Well, as y'all are finding your seat, we can uh, continue fellowshipping afterwards, but we'll uh, move on with worship. But I just want to open us up in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the rain you gave us last night. We thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Thank you that we get to come together in this place and we get to hear from you. So, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to us from your word because we're listening for you. And now we just ask that you would just take this time where we give an offering back to you of praise, uh, that you would receive it, that it would be a blessing back to you, just a small portion of what you've blessed us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken. Safe. 
built on you. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't fail. like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so he is just me loves like a I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, His portion and we are his portion and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes his grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest and I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, he loves. One more time. Yeah, he loves us, oh, how he loves us, oh, how he loves us.
time. One more time. Oh, how he loves. Sounds so pretty just with our voices. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Let's just receive it in your heart. Oh, how he loves. He loves. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. Amen. Thank you. Well, um, we're going to continue a series that we started a couple weeks ago um, called Hostage, uh, Breaking Free from the Things in Life that Hold Us Hostage. And so uh, our first week uh, in this series, we, um, we talked about uh, bitterness and how bitterness can hold us hostage. And last week, uh, we continued the series and we talked about worry. And today I want to talk to us about materialism. Materialism and how it keeps us in a grip and it holds us hostage from the things that really are important and that God wants to bless us with in this life. Billy Graham has a quote, you'll see it up on the screen. It says, materialism may do what a foreign invader could never hope to achieve. Materialism robs a nation of its spiritual strength. That's a pretty poignant statement. Billy Graham has many of those, but that one was quite um, tough and it hits pretty hard. And so whether we want to admit it or not, we are in a war per se, or at least a battle for our spiritual strength. And the world has waged war on us, if you haven't noticed. They want us to believe that if we just have more stuff, that we will be happy and important and secure. That's the lie that the world wants us to believe. And sadly, they're winning this battle. Uh, they're doing a pretty good job of it. In fact, Time Magazine did a, a research study recently, and Time Magazine says the average American spends $1,300 for every $1,000 they bring in. Now, you don't have to be a mathematician to understand that is not good math, right? That does not help us individually. It doesn't help our country. We are losing at a rate of $300 per $1,000 that we bring in in this battle against materialism. Many of us have found ourselves in debt, overwhelmed by minimum payments and interest rising and different things. Right now, many people that went into debt with 4 and 5% interest rates now are suffering under the debt of 16 to 25% interest rates. And it's causing many people to lose things that they have, to turn in cars, to give up on houses that they bought, all different kinds of things. And you know, our country... Uh, or our leadership is no different. This country, uh, for over the last two decades, has been going into more and more debt. Our national debt is about $34.6 trillion as of today, and the national debt, get this, grows by $1 trillion every 100 days. I, I just, I can't even wrap my brain around that. That is a ridiculous amount. So what do you call it when output exceeds input? Well, a bodybuilder would call that overworked, right? An electrician would call that overloaded. A banker would call that overdrafted. Everybody identify with that one? And a politician would call it normal. No, sorry, couldn't help it. Um, so, so why do we do it? Why do we make ourselves a hostage to materialism? There was a book, it's not a Christian book, but it's an interesting book, and it's called Searching for Values in an Age of Greed. And on the front, uh, inside front cover, this was uh, what it says, and I thought it was really poignant. It says, more, period. 
If there is one word that summarizes Americans' hopes and obsessions, that's more. More money, more success, more luxury, more gizmos. We live for more. We live for our next raise. We live, live for our next house. And the things that we already have pale in comparison to the things we want or don't yet have. It's a disease that we are all afflicted with that is called materialism. So I just want to look at Proverbs 27, 20. It says this, human desires are like the world of the dead. There is always room for more. It's always room for more. We just always need more. Why? Why do we have this nature within us? I believe we don't see materialism correctly. And I want to just give you three, what I would call misconceptions that hold us hostage to materialism. The first one is this. The first misconception is having more things will make us more happy. And I know that's not grammatically correct, but work with me here. Um, having more things will will make us more happy. That's just a, a lie we'd like to believe. And advertisers know this, and so they run ads um, like this one. And so there's a, a Coke ad that Mark's going to be putting up on the screen. And um, so, you know, if you're struggling with your relationship, you and your wife aren't getting along, just go get a Coke. I mean, don't those people look happy? You know, you just get a Coke and life is happy. Your relationships are going to be great. That's what the advertisers are going to say. I mean, I want people to, you know, smile and laugh when I'm around them like that. So just, I guess I just need to bring Coke with me everywhere I go. Uh, the Coca-Cola Coke, let's be clear for uh, anybody that's visually impaired like myself, right? Um, so, you know, Pepsi decided they wanted to get into this game. So they figured they would, they would do the same thing. But they just said, you know, happiness is a choice. Choose Pepsi over Coke and you'll be happy, right? So they didn't even have to put a picture of anybody. They just said, you choose, right? And um, so anyhow, let's stay in the beverage category. And I, I like this one. I thought this was pretty interesting. Uh, this was uh, Lipton Tea. And they say, you can't buy happiness, but you can buy tea. And that's pretty much the same thing. I'm not sure that's true, but, you know, again, they're trying to say, drink our tea, you'll be happy, right? Um, so now, now this last one, I actually think this one, uh, it's not a, a beverage one, but I think it's, it's probably, you know, a little, it's, it's legit. Let's just leave it at that. And so here's what it says. It says, you can't buy happiness, which is a true statement, but 25 cent donuts can help. There you go. And that, I think that one's really true, right? No. Yeah. Well, until it starts to get your waistline, right? But the point is advertisers know that we think we need more stuff. And if we get more stuff, we'll be happy. And they're going to play on that, and they're going to tempt us with that. Now, I'm not saying that advertisers are evil. Uh, they're actually pretty smart. Uh, they just are tapping into this human nature or struggle that we have within us. So let's look at Ecclesiastes 5.10. Here's what it says. Those who love money will never have enough. It's foolishness to think that wealth brings happiness. Hmm. Do you know who wrote that? Do you know who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? King Solomon, the wealthiest man in the world at the time. And if anybody would know, if money would solve your problems, it would be him. And he would have told us. But the answer is, it doesn't. It doesn't solve our problems. It doesn't bring us happiness. We see this in our culture today. Some of the most wealthiest people uh, commit suicide. Now, I'm not judging those people or saying, I'm, what I'm saying though is money didn't solve. It may have brought short-term happiness, but it didn't solve their life's problems. They were not satisfied. They didn't know what to do. They saw no way out. Now, another misconception about materialism is this. It's a, that more things will make us more important. 
<laughs> if I just have that nice home and that nice neighborhood, then I'll be important, right? If I just have a nicer car and a luxury car, and then people will think, but that guy, man, he's important. Now, if I get a luxury car, that's a whole other story, right? Stop me before I drive down the road. Huh? But the point is, sometimes we think status symbols, these luxury things, they'll make us more important. And here's what it says, uh, what Jesus told us in Luke 12, 15. Beware, don't always be wishing for what you don't have. For real life and real living are not related to how rich we are. Real life is not correlated with how much stuff or money we have. If you want significance or importance, you're not going to find it there. You're not going to find it in stuff or money. So, we think more stuff is going to make us more happy. We think it's going to make us more imp important. And lastly, the, the last misconception I want to bring up is more things, we think more things will make us more secure. Now, this is one I really, I really do understand. Um, and so, you know, it's human nature to find our security in our bank accounts. I teach people about you know, personal finance and we talk to them about an emergency fund and having anywhere from three to nine months in an emergency fund so that something happens. And that's your safety cushion, that's your safety net, that's what you rely on, right? And I teach them this. And, and I, I do believe that's a good thing to do. But if we put all of our security in that emergency fund, I think we're we're actually setting ourselves up for failure because we can't put our trust in wealth alone. Wealth is fleeting. If you've lived long enough on this planet, then you've been through a recession or two. And you will see that wealth comes and wealth goes. We can't find our security in it. Once again, we look to Solomon and he says this in Proverbs 18.11. It says this, The rich man thinks of his wealth as an imp impregnable defense, a high wall of safety. <laughs> what a dreamer. So Solomon, he's telling us, hey, you can't trust in just your wealth, just your bank account. Your money can't protect you when you have a major illness. It'll run out. Your money can't protect you when you lose a loved one. It won't bring them back. Money is fleeting. It is not your security. It's helpful, and you should be good stewards of it, and you should have an emergency fund. Trust me, that is an important thing. But you can't place your security in it. These misconceptions, these lies that we believe, they are what hold us captive. We're trying to get stuff, materialism, things, and money to satisfy needs that only God can satisfy. Only God can bring us happiness, true happiness. Only God knows our true identity, and only God is our true security. The only... These things only come through Jesus Christ. He is our salvation. He is our identity. He is our security. So, what do we do about it? What do we do about the fact that when these things become what we put our faith in and what we put our trust in, then they become idols, then we start to worship them, and then they hold us hostage? What do we do about it? How do we get out of that situation? Well, if we want to break the grip of materialism, I want us to look at four things, four R's, you know, pastors, we always want to use some letters. So here we go. Today I'm using R. So uh, four R's that we're going to look at for how to break the grip of materialism. So the first one is resist the comparison trap. Resist the compar comparison trap. Who here has a love-hate relationship with social media? I do. Sometimes I love it. I think it's 
Uh, it's a good thing. I like to share things, see what's going on with my friends that are far away in California, wherever. But then there's other times you just go, this is just garbage, right? It's just this love-hate relationship. So don't compare your real life to your friend's highlight reel. Don't compare your real life to your friend's highlight reel, which is what social media is. Let's just be honest. Social media is our highlight reel. Uh, I don't know if you know some of you like uh, the Dallas Cowboys, some of you don't, but Michael Irvin, it was interesting. He was talking one time in an interview, and he was like, you know, you watch film of a game of Michael Irvin, you know, because he likes to talk himself in the third person. He's like, here's what you're going to see. Michael Irvin runs down the field, runs back to the huddle. Michael Irvin runs down the field. Michael Irvin runs back to the huddle. Michael Irvin puts a block on the defensive end. Michael Irvin runs back to the huddle. This sounds really boring and mundane, but play after play after play that happens, then it's third and nine and he gets a 20 yard reception. Maybe that makes the highlight reel, but probably not. The only thing that makes the highlight reel is the touchdown catch. But play after play after play, he ran down the field and came back to the huddle. Ran down the field, came back to the huddle. It's mundane, it's boring. But if you compare your life to the one or two touchdown passes that someone has, then you feel mundane and they're amazing. The comparison trap can get really, really bad. And so, you know, social media, it's, it's just the highlight reel. Now, I, one of the things I can tell you is, I remember when I bought my, my truck, little, little canyon, you know, an, an older canyon, but a GMC Canyon, nice little truck. I was, I was proud of it. I thought it was a nice truck, got a good deal on it. And I remember like that week, another friend of mine got a, you know, a King Ranch, you know, loaded truck and it was jacked up and it was, and I was like, yeah, my little truck's pretty wimpy. You know, I just, when you start to compare it, it's like, rrr, rrr. well, you know, a few years later, talking with my friend, he had to turn that truck back in. Couldn't make the payments. Mine was paid off. That's the information you don't get on social media, you know? Looks shiny, looks beautiful, but he doesn't tell you the payments are $695, you know? Or whatever it is. Sometimes we want to compare what we have to what other people post on social media, and it can get us into a really, really bad trap. So don't compare the real to the highlight reel, is what I would say. Now, Paul. It's interesting, Paul was known, uh, it, there were some people that were calling Paul a, a keyboard warrior. I know he didn't have a real keyboard, but what they were saying was, Paul talked a big talk when he wrote his letters, but in person he just wasn't that big of a dude. And so that's, you know, kind of the equivalent today, you know, keyboard warrior. He talks a big talk online, but it's not the same in real life. And so he was addressing these rumors and these things about him. And when he addressed it, um, I want to just read, it's from 2 Corinthians 10 and 12. Here's what he says as he's addressing these rumors. He says, not that we dare to classify or our com compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Another translation would say they're foolish. So don't compare. That's what Paul's saying. He's going, hey, you can talk a big talk. You can say I'm not who I think I am, but I know who I am. I know what I, I do. I know what I have. And stop comparing. Don't compare yourself to me. Don't compare yourself to each other. Just stop it. Don't look at your friend's post on Facebook and say, I wish my kids were like that. I wish my kids got those kind of awards. I wish they'd obey like that. But don't fall into the comparison trap. Resist it. Resist it. Second thing I want us to think about, and if we want to break free of the grip of materialism, is to rejoice in what we do have. Rejoice in what we do have. Be content in what we do have. Uh, let's look at our... Our next verse, Ecclesiastes 6, 9. So we're going back to Solomon here. Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless, like chasing the wind. 
Don't think about what you don't have. Think about what you do have. I remember uh, recently we had some well issues and we were running out of water all the time. And we were like, oh no, is our well gone dry? And what's going on? And we're having people come out. And man, I'm telling you, when I turn on my water now, I am so happy for what I have. Turned out to be just a setting on a pump and we were just so elated that we weren't out of water. Because, you know, water, it's a pretty necessary thing for life. And sometimes we just take it for granted that we go pull that lever up and stuff comes out. And it's, it's healthy for us to drink. But it made me realize how blessed and how lucky we are to have running water in our home. And then when we had the freeze a couple years in a row, and we had no power, no heat. Man, now when I turn my heater on, when I turn my AC on, when my light flicks on, I'm like, woohoo! I'm excited, right? We just sometimes take for granted that we get to live where we have electricity, water, heat, and air conditioning. We have to be grateful for what we have. We are so, so blessed. Well, if we're always looking for what we don't have, then we will always be angry and bitter and empty. Um, I want us to look at Hebrews 13, 5. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. No matter what, no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad you think it is, the struggle you have, one thing we do have is Jesus. He promises he will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. So, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you have the free gift of eternal life. There's no price to put on that. There's no value to put on that. And then the fact that he promises to never leave us, never forsake us. He's always with us. How do you put a value on that? For that, we can be forever grateful. That's what we have. If we have a relationship with Jesus, we have that, no matter what you're going through. And so, if we want to break the grip of materialism, we must rejoice in what we do have. A third thing I want us to look at and, and to think about as we want to break this great grip of materialism is to return the first 10% to God. Now, I may have just lost a few of you right there, right? You're like, okay, I was going with you, David, but now we're talking about my pocketbook, right? So returning the first 10% to God, that's, some people call that a tithe, but let's look at what Malachi 3.10 says. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough, enough food for my temple. If you do says the Lord of heaven, of heaven's army. I will open the window of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it all in. Try it. Put me to the test. Now this is the only time I know of in scripture where God says, test me. This is it. It's about money. He's saying, bring your tithes, and I'll bless you. And he said, try it. Test me. Everything we have is a gift from God. And so we're instructed to give back a portion of that gift to him as an offering, as a tithe. And so, you know, don't look at it as, as giving 10% necessarily. It's not yours in the first place. Think of it as that you get to keep 90% of what God has blessed you with. Um, I remember when I was, um, I was a pastor in a church in San Antonio, and I used to work out. It was called Spectrum Gym at the time. I think it's now called Gold's Gym. It got bought out there in San Antonio. But I was working out at the gym, and one of the, the guys that was kind of new, and, um, and he had actually started volunteering with me in uh, our student ministry, and so he knew me, and, and so he was new to the church, and 
but he was getting real involved, and so he came over to me one day, he kind of, kind of cornered me, accosted me at the gym, and I was like, whoa, what's going on? He's like, okay, Pastor David, I got to talk to you about something. I said, okay, what's up? And he's like, um, I'm in a small group with these guys, and they keep talking about um, giving money to God, and they, they're like putting dollar amounts to it, like 10%, and some of them are doing more than that, and they're talking about how God's blessing them and everything, and, they, and they're making it sound like you got to do this. So I need to know, is this some kind of membership due you guys have? And I'm like, hold on, you know, back it up. There's no membership due. We don't ask for your tax returns. We don't find out what you make or anything like that. Sounds to me like you're just in a group of guys that have tested God. They've trusted him with what he's blessed them with. And then they're seeing that God's blessing them and blessing those around them. And they just want to, they're excited about it. And they want to share it. And he's like, that's it. <laughs> that's, it. That, that's it. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to, and ask you and shake you down next Sunday when you go to church. He was really worried about it. And so, you know, over time, he started to understand that, um, and he felt more comfortable about that. But he was worried, and I get it. This is not a deal where I'm a pastor standing up here. If you give 10%, then, you know, it'll double your money in, you know, 90 days or anything like that. There, there's no guarantee of that. And that's not what the scripture's telling us. Blessings don't always come in doubling your money. If you need to get return on your investment, go talk to a financial advisor. That's not what this is about. This is about giving what, is, what God says is owed and then making sure that, that you put yourself in a position to receive blessing from him. The blessing in the first place was what you had. Giving back is just an act of obedience. So we give to experience the joy of giving. We don't give to get. We give to experience the joy of giving, to be more like Jesus. So it's not an easy thing. Every time we get a paycheck and it increases, it increases your opportunity to trust him even more. And so, he's not after your money. God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. He wants to know that you trust him. He wants your heart. And so some of you are thinking, well, okay, this, this sounds interesting, and maybe I'll try this concept of tithing, but maybe I'll have to do that when I have a little bit more money. Let me just warn you, if that's what you're thinking, if you're listening online, you're thinking, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe I'll try it. I'll, I'll put him to the test, but... Maybe I'll do that after I have a little bit more money. Actually, it gets harder the more money you have. Just FYI. The more money you get, the harder it gets. There's, a, there's an old preacher story, and it goes like this. The salesman, he decided to start tithing, and so he was making 30 k a year, and he tithed, and he was like, yeah, I can do that. And he, he tithed, and then as he was doing that, he started selling more and doing better, and, and God just seemed to be blessing him. And he's, then he's making 50 k a year, and then Pretty soon, uh, it continues to go like that, and now he's making 100k a year, and he was like, okay, I just, uh, you know, a little bit harder to write that check, but I'm writing that check, and God just continued to bless him, and all of his hard work, and what he was doing, and finally, he was making $400,000 per year, and so that Sunday, he went up, and he talked to the pastor after church, and he said, pastor, I need to talk to you, and he's like, what's going on? He said, well, you know, I've been doing this tithing thing, and when I was making 50k, I could handle that. When I was making even 100k, it got harder but I can handle it. But now I'm making 400K and I, I just can't seem to find the strength, the ability to write that check. It's just too hard. Would you please pray for me? And the preacher said, yeah, come on over here. And he puts his arm around him and he says, Lord, we just pray that you would decrease this man's income to a point that he could trust you with it. And the guy was like, whoa, 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 whoa right? And so we, what I'm getting at, it gets harder. If you're going to wait till you have more to give your heart and trust God, it's just going to get harder. So, seriously, it's hard, and I understand. And this is uh, one of the reasons why we don't pass an offering plate here. We don't want to make a barrier between you and God about money. That is not our desire. But it does take money to turn on the lights, keep things going, pay the insurance, those kind of things. And so we do have to have money to keep the church going. And we want to bless the community around us, and we find ourselves unable to do that. 
because we are we're not making enough each month to pay all the bills we're dipping into savings and i'm not saying that to to guilt you i just want you to be aware of where your church is and so i understand it's hard and i'm not telling you um that you're promised to have a certain return or that you are going to be blessed in a certain monetary way. But I do know this. I do know that God says it's his and it's our job to be obedient, to give back a portion of what he's given to us. And so I know some of you, you've been burned by other churches and you may say, well, I don't know. I just don't trust church. And, um, and so we just don't want to pressure you here at the sanctuary. But I, um, I just can't talk to you about breaking the grip of materialism in your life without talking to you about tithing. I just would be not doing my job if I didn't mention it. So I just want to look at Deuteronomy 14, 23. It says this, Bring this tithe before the Lord your God at the place he shall choose as his sanctuary. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn of your flock and, and herds. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. The purpose of it is to put God first. So when the money comes in, when the paycheck comes in, you take 10% and you just turn around and give it right back. You got to do it first thing, because man, if you don't, there's more month at the end of the money, right? You go, oh, I, r I ran out. I don't have any more. So first things first. You put him, you make a priority of God, and you give him the portion that is owed back to him. If you were to ask me what is one thing that I want to see my kids doing when they're in their 20s and 30s, what do I want to see that, that I've been able to impart upon them, that I see them adulting and they're doing something it would be this. It would be tithing. And you're going, well, wait a minute, tithing, really? I mean, I want my kids to be baptized, yes. I want my kids to read the Bible. I want my kids to go to church. But, but baptisms, it's a one-time event. Going to church, it, you don't really have to do much there. But if my kids are tithing, then I know that God has their heart. And so if there's one thing, it would be that. Because I want to know that God has my kid's heart. And so if there's one prayer I would have for you guys, it would be the same. I want what's best for my kids, and I want what's best for you. Now I know you guys, I can't see you, but I'm sure your eyes are glazing over, and you're going, enough, enough, enough about this, right? The Bible does tell us where your treasure is, so your heart is. And so that's my prayer for my kids. That's my prayer for you. And so I am... Um, I'm going to move on to the, the, the next point. But to set up this next point, I want to go to 1 Timothy uh, verse six, uh, I mean chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. And it says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So who's this verse talking about? It says the rich, right? Who is the rich? You're like, that's not me. The rich is you and me. <laughs> if you live in America and you have a home or apartment and it has electricity, water, and AC, then you are in the top 3% of the wealthy people of the world. You are rich. You are blessed. We can't live for the things of this world. We can't be attached to our stuff. So the fourth R is this. Refocus our 
brief, uh, excuse me, if we want to break the, the grip of materialism, we have to refocus on permanent values. Permanent values. We have to focus on the things that are yet to come. The things of eternity. We can't focus on the things of this world. They're fleeting. We must focus on the eternal or the permanent. Colossians 3, 2 says this. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Sometimes we don't, um, we don't think about this until maybe we've lost someone we love. And we just go, you know, I'd give anything for one more minute. I'd give anything for one more day. And some of you that are listening online, maybe even some people here, you don't know where you're going to spend eternity. And someone has gone before us, and they are in heaven, and you don't know if you're going to spend eternity with them. And I can just tell you, you can know. You can know. There's no I hope so's. That Pepsi ad said happiness is a choice. Not true. But your eternal value, where you're going to spend eternity, that is a choice. Here's the good news. The good news is this, that God already chose you. He chose you. You have been chosen, period. The question is, are you going to accept? The invitation has been sent out. Are you going to RSVP? And are you going to spend eternity with God in heaven and with those who you wish you could spend one more minute with? And then there's people you're going to look around here on earth and you're going to say, I, I don't want to see in my relationship with them. And you've never shared the gospel with them. Share it. Focus on eternal things. Focus on permanent things. Don't worry about buying the better car, the nicer home, when you have friends and family that are not going to be with you in heaven. If you want to put your money into something, put your money into something that's going to bring people closer to Jesus. If you want to put your time into something, put your time into something that's going to bring people closer to Jesus. Your effort, your time, your money. Don't buy more stuff. The more we invest in eternal things, the more we long for what is eternal. Sofiana is going to come back up and she's going to lead us in the last song, but as she does that, let me just kind of summarize what I'm saying there. In summary, I would say this, invest in people over things. Invest in relationships that will last for an eternity. Invest in people over things. If you've never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you just need to admit you've made mistakes. Believe that Jesus died for you and choose to make him the Lord of your life. Choose to trust him. Trust him with your finances. Trust him with your entire life. And he promises he will never leave you or forsake you. He promises he will give you riches beyond what you could imagine. And if you know someone around you that doesn't know Jesus, maybe today's their day of salvation. Maybe God's prompting you to say something. Maybe that's your way of saying, you know, I'm not going to get online and, and get on Amazon and find out what I'm going to buy next. Maybe I'm going to just go through my phone and see who I need to call. Maybe instead of buying one more thing, I'm going to buy somebody a lunch. And I'm going to share the love of Jesus with them. I don't know. I don't know what it is for you. But I pray as we stand and we sing this song that, that you would think about your relationship with God and your relationship with others. It's very simple. If you want to focus on things, you will end up frustrated. But God said, when, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. Don't love money. Don't love stuff. Love God, love others. 
That's the way to a blessed life. That's the way to break a grip on materialism. That's the way not to be held hostage by the things and the stuff of this world. Let's stand. Let's sing.
emotions rise and a soul resting your embrace for I am yours and you So, Lord, we just thank you so much that you care about us, that you'll never leave us or forsake us. And I pray this week that you would just be with each person that is here or watching online. I pray you would help us to resist the comparison trap. You would help us to rejoice in what we do have. You would help us return the first 10% to God and to refocus on permanent things. Lord, I just pray your blessing upon each person here. I pray your face would shine upon them that you would be with them as they go where they live and work and play. I pray you'd help them to be a light in a dark world. I pray you'd help them to share the love and the blessings you've given them to those around them and that they may come to know you. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, next week is our first uh, week of the month, and so we will be having our fellowship um, but we're going to go ahead and the church is going to buy pizza and we're going to have some salad here. And so, um, uh, you know, we don't need to have a lot of sides brought. So if you want to bring maybe a, a dessert or a small side, you could. But if you're like, well, pizza and salad sounds great to me and just want to bring a few dollars and put that in the offering plate, that would be fine too. Um, we're going to kind of make it a little bit easier on everybody this week. Um, and then um, we will uh, we'll just have some good time of fellowship and, and eating and grubbing. Bring a friend, bring somebody you know. We'd love to fellowship with them as well. And uh, so we look forward to seeing you next week. And I pray you have a great week. Be blessed.